All right, ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, it's time for another student of the gun radio. Aren't you excited? You should be freaking excited if you're not excited. Well, take a deep breath, turn around, stand up, sit down, fight, 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 and then you will be ready. Yes, indeed, you will be ready. You should be ready for student of the gun radio. What do we got today? Let's go to the show notes. The show notes uh, it says episode 1203, 1203 individually. Uh, numbered episodes. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. We're going to talk about, oh, you want to talk about cartridges today? Yeah. Uh, 260 Remington. We're going to geek out about cartridges a little bit. We're going to talk about AK knowledge or act knowledge, as Sonny likes to say. Uh, we're talking about act knowledge. Uh, how to shoot, when to shoot, what now? That's going to play into the Student of Gun University about being dangerous on demand. And then we've got more backdoor gun control from the glorious People's Republic of uh, New Jersey, uh, where the Stasi reigns. And uh, we're going to talk about that. And, of course, anything else that we feel like talking about uh, here on today's Student of the Gun Radio. Welcome to Student of the Gun Radio, planting freedom seeds since 2013. Here we don't just talk about guns and gear. We also discuss current events and politics, because guns are politics. Now, sit back, relax, and allow today's episode to drift ever so gently into your ear. Please welcome your co-hosts, founder of Mastermind Media and Consulting Group, Jared Martin, and the shipping ogre, Zach Martin. Now, give it up to your beloved host, the Pimp Hand of America, Professor Paul Martin. All right, I was just adding something to, uh, to the notes. Yeah, so let's add something to our notes here. Oh. Man, I don't know where to start. Well, I, I know where to start. Start at the beginning. Let people know that there's a Q&A. If you are watching in the Discord channel, that's uh, studentofthegun.com slash Discord, uh, you can watch live. You can watch these shows live when we do them, and you can post comments and questions and concerns. Uh, if you have concerns, you can throw them in there into the Discord channel. And uh, when we see them, when we see them, if we see them, do we see them? I don't know. We do see them. Uh, if we feel like that, that your question will benefit the rest of the audience, we will answer it publicly. If we don't feel like it will benefit the rest of the audience, we will answer it privately. How's that sound? How's that sound? Sound good to you? Sounds right. good well, to me. It sounds good to you. It sounds good to me. Then we'll move on. Oh, man. Gee whiz. So did you, did you see, uh, did I share the, the out of stock, uh, the Yeet Cannon out of stock uh, YC9? Oh, I haven't no, seen that. No, I did not see that. No, you. but good. Yeah, so it's good slash bad. You, you, you guys know that I I subscribe to every online gun retailer in the history of the world, right? <laughs> and so every day I get between six and eight emails from Aim Surplus, Classic Firearms, Palmetto State, Primary Arms, blah blah blah, Optics Planet, you name it. Just fill in the blanks, right? And I got one the other day from Classic Firearms, and it said, and it said new High Point YC9. And so I was like, oh, this will be cool. So I clicked on it, and I like, opened dude, did it. did you know that they released it? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I know what? So I, I clicked on the, the, the email, and I opened it up, and it said, sorry, out of stock. And so I screenshot it, and I sent it to Charlie, and he said, oh, yeah, everybody ran out. He goes, we just did a second shipping. They, they said it's a good. second second shipping run. Glad <gasps> Imagine that. All the haters. Hate. And that's the thing about High Point is they just laugh all the way to the bank. They're just laughing all the way to the bank. They have accepted their position and they have leaned into it, which I love. Oh, yeah. I love. I love when, when uh, people and companies are authentic about who they are and what market they serve. Yeah, that's right. So if yeah. you guys did not, if you're a new listener or you missed last week's episode, we did a review of the Yeet Cannon. You can go listen to that. It's episode 1202. Because did you know that 1203 minus one is 1202? Mm, that makes you didn't, sense. now you do. Yeah, 1202. Yep. Yes. Uh, so there you it's go. It's no longer two well, minutes to midnight. It's three minutes after midnight. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so, yeah, there is no 2403, 2402, 20, it's, it's 24, 2400, and then 0001. I told you about that, right? Like, every once in a while we Well, have, hold on a second. I thought it was 2359 and then 0000. zero, zero, zero. No, well, either one is correct. Either okay. 24, 2400 zero, zero can be correct or, um, cause there's not four zeros. You never do four zeros. Right. So Wait, it's but, two, four, zero, zero. Oh, so I then, didn't know that. I've always seen it. Zero, 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 zero. I've never seen a 24. No, no, I no. Oh. it's not. You never do four zeros. You do 2400 and then you do zero, 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 one. Okay. So, but when I was in the Marine Corps and we had to do handwritten log books, and they had these, these green hardback covered handwritten log books with black pen only because she's using a fucking blue pen. Oops. Sorry. Not a grad program. Um, black pen only, and it has to be printed. No cursive. That's how I stopped writing in cursive because I wrote in cursive my whole life until I got into the Marine Corps and started doing handwritten logs and you, everything has to be printed so that it'll be legible. Because they really completely off topic. Yep. I have a question. Sure. Send it. How come we as humans stopped using cursive in the first place? Uh, well, we, well, the children stopped using it because they stopped teaching it because it was difficult. Uh, that's why. I mean, I learned, I did cursive, obviously. Yeah, I, I did in school. Writing too. cursive. They, and, they and, still do today. At least. And, you. Uh, you know, I, I, I wrote. Like I, I wrote letters home in cursive and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, when I got in the Marine Corps, uh, no cursive, printing only, slow, legible printing. It makes but sense because my point with the really difficult to is every once in a while you'd get you'd get like bless their heart the functional retard, and, and you open the logbook and they they got to, you know, they would write something in twenty three forty five. And then they would write something in at twenty four hundred, and then they'd write something at twenty four twenty seven and twenty four. Like ah, stop! No. That, that person needs to go to sleep. <laughs> and then the then the well then the first sergeant would come in and examine the logbooks and be like, "All right, we're gonna have a class now. We have to have the twenty four hour clock class because PFC Snuffy freaking." made a log entry at 2437 like there is no 2437 homeboy and, and the thing is is you, you know you you're like you want to ask me like okay well, are we going to stop there or are we going to go to 25 26 I mean, we, you know uh, you're like, and that's how i learned it. you can't tell me what to do yeah well that's what we learned 24 hour time how do you do 24 hour time and 24 hour time you know try and People are like, oh, I can't figure that out. I can't figure that out. I'm like, look, here's the deal. It's not that freaking hard. If it's afternoon, you know when noon is, right? It's the middle of the day. That's one two zero zero, right? If it's afternoon in the PM, you just add twelve, right? And if it's in the morning, it's just straight up. So. 1 p.m. is add 12, 1,300. 2 p.m., add 12, 1,400. There you go. Uh, you ever been in a train station where they had an analog clock that had 24-hour time? No. You ever seen a 24-hour analog clock? I have not. They make them. And 24-hour uh, clock. Yeah, and, you know, trains, trains have to be exactly on time. They have to leave exactly on time. They have to arrive exactly on time and, uh, and so on and so forth. And you can't have confusion, you know, say, well, what, what time does the, the train arrive Four, Cause there could be a train arriving at zero 400 or at 4 PM, uh, you know, train arrives at, arrives at 8 AM or, or the tra train arrives at eight. Is that 8 PM or 8 AM? There you go. All right. You want to talk about, let's go. You want to geek out about cartridges and, and hardware and stuff. All right. Brownells bullet points is our opportunity to geek out about cartridges and hardware stuff. All right. 
right. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. We've been we've been talking about the uh, the uh, Brownells MPO scope series this summer uh, because they put them on sale for the summer, and they're a stupid good deal, like crazy good deal for all the features you get. All the features you get for that uh, in those scopes, uh, they, yeah, they're insane. Especially a 34 millimeter tube. Um, oh, yeah. Did did you see that that Leupold decided that they had to do a 35 millimeter tube? Oh, nice. Yeah. You know why? Everybody else is doing 34s, right? Yeah. Pushing all leads 34. The Night Force is 34. MPOs 34, so I'm sorry. Because if you do 35, then you can't use 34 millimeter rings from anybody else but them. That's smart. So they're going above and beyond, and they also have an opportunity to sell another product. To be douchebags and be. force you to buy their rings. Yeah, but I mean, if you think about it, a 35 millimeter tube means you have more elevation. So there is a benefit there. Well, what if? <laughs> when does it end? I know, I know. So they say, well, all right, you know, we're we're in this this scope wars thing now. It's like, all right, so we did everything thirty years ago. The standard was one inch tube. That was it, right? One inch. Yeah. The, Seriously. The two, yeah. Thirty years ago, standard scope tube for a center fire gun was one inch. Now a twenty two scope, a rim fire scope, is even smaller. I think the rim fire scope tubes are three quarters. They're either three quarters or seven eighths. I can't remember exactly, um, but they're smaller than an inch. And then you had one inch, so you just needed to get one inch rings, one inch rings, one inch rings, one inch rings. And then they're like, you know what? We could make a thirty millimeter tube, uh, and that would give us even more. And so I was like, well, people are like, well, it seems a little excessive, but okay. And then G Watt comes up. And thousand, you know, thousand yard shots are become average now. Uh, thousand yard shots become average, and so you're like, well, we need need even more elevation. Now, I was actually doing some research yesterday about um, some with some scope companies, and there was one scope company in particular uh, that had a 35 millimeter tube, but only had 25 mils of adjustment on the elevation knob. And I'm thinking, that's kind of weird because the MPO scope has a 34 millimeter tube and has 40 mils of adjustment on the elevation knob. I don't know. Uh, I I, kind of feel a little bit bad for these manufacturers nowadays because there's so much going on. And they've got, you've got, uh, are we going to talk about the, the Rimfire or the Remington, we will. But think about it. So you've got the commercial side that thinks and believes that they want X. Then you have the military side that says, well, if you're, if you're going to sell us a scope, it has to be blank, right? It has to be this. Uh, and then you had the, you know, you had the mill dot reticle. So 10 years ago, about 10 years ago or so, maybe a little more, um, they came up with a mill dot reticle, and it was just it was crosshairs with little dots, right? You had a dot in the middle. You had dots going north and south. You had dots going east and west. And the reason they did that was because you could use the mill dot reticle for range estimation, right? And uh, that was something that they were teaching. They're like, okay, you know, at so many yards. You know, a, a human being that's between this many, you know, if it's between the two dots or the three dots or whatever, if you line it up and you're looking at an enemy soldier and uh, he's he fills three mils, like he threw, you know, he's three mils and you're like, okay, you can do the math and so forth. And they, you know, they did the same thing with like, okay, a truck or, or whatever. Uh, and so it looked like that we were going to have a standard. Mill radian adjustments, mill dot reticle. <laughs> that lasted all of 15 minutes. You know why that lasted all of 15 minutes? Guess. 
because every scope manufacturer had to come up with their own unique patented special reticle. So Leupold has their own patented reticle with it, their own name on it. Night Force has their reticle with their special name on it. Bushnell Elite has their reticle with their name on it. Fill in the blank, you know, Burris Vortex has their reticle with their name on it. Nobody, they, nobody could just say, hey, this is the standard reticle. Let's use it. Everybody who has a mill radian adjustment scope will use the mill dot reticle. We'll all be good. Nope. Couldn't do it. They just couldn't do it. And then, and then we, we ended up in like the reticle wars <laughs> where every month somebody was coming out with it. You're like, well, I know you thought that one was good, but check this one out. Uh, and thanks to the guys at Horus um, for filling the lens with, with ink, <laughs> basically. <laughs> Uh, and I, and bless their hearts. I mean, I get it. Trust me, I get it. Um, but when it comes to when it comes to, they're like, oh, you don't have to dial. You don't have to dial. You just hold over. Just hold over. Just hold over. I'm like, eh. here's the reality of the situation. The reality of the situation is you. It's not possible to make a holdover reticle. That is 100% universal. That works everywhere, every time. They could be close, but they can't work everywhere, every time. Well, what do you mean, Paul? Come on. How, how do you know? How do you know? You're not a scope maker. All right, well, think about it. What affects the impact of the bullet? What affects how it impacts? Lots of things. Barrel length. Rifling. Does it have a suppressor on it? Does it not have a suppressor on it? Does it have a can or no can? Because if you put a can on it, if you zero it at a hundred with you know straight up normal barrel, zero to hundred, you're good to go. Hitting the X ring at hundred, then you screw a can on, you shoot the exact same ammunition, same distance, everything. The bullet's going to impact higher because they actually get a little more velocity uh, on the round cartridge than you did. So now, did, did, the, did the reticle factor in for a can? Did the reticle factor for a 20-inch barrel or 24-inch barrel or an 18-inch barrel? How many different loads are there for the 308 Winchester? It's 155. There's 150s. There's 155s. There's 168s. There's 175s. And then every once in a while you get something in the middle or, or some, there there are a couple of companies out there making really light bullets, like 130s, right? So, and what elevation is it? Is it sea level? Because the bullet impact at sea level and the bullet impact at 4,000 feet and the bullet impact at 7,000 feet is not going to be the same. So all of these holdover reticles are cool but at very best, they're a, they're a rough estimate. They're a guesstimate. You know, and they'll tell you, they're like, oh, and when we shot them at, you know, when we tested it, it was point of aim, point of impact, one, two, three hundred yards. Yeah, you had a controlled setting. And it was, and that was designed for that specific round. Now, for, for instance, people like uh, Trigicon with the ACOG, what they when they did their holdover reticle, they actually used they they used mil spec ammo, and 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 it, it said this holdover is for the U.S. Army Mark One Nine Three or Mark Two Six Two or you know whichever. It's it's for this specific load fired out of an M4 with a fourteen and a half inch barrel. That's what it's for, and if anything else, it's going to vary. Right. It's funny because you'd think, I mean, I guess the more experience you have with the with the thing, right, the activity that we're doing here, the long-range precision shooting, the more experience you have with that, the more you understand that these things will matter for sure. It's just interesting to me. The more experience I get, the more I learn that, like, everything matters. Yeah. For instance, the difference between a 103-grain bullet and a 105-grain bullet isn't much, but it is a few clicks at distance. Yeah, a long and you range. You think yeah. that oh, it's only, it's only two, 
difference is two. It's like it can't matter. Well, yeah. it actually does. Is it? And what kind of bullet is it? Yeah, yeah, and that you know, is assuming everything jacket? else is the same, like what this previous class that I actually took in, instead of coaching, I was using the Black Hills ammo, and it was everything was the same except for 103 grain, 105 grain, or maybe it was 103 and 100. No, it was 108. It was three and eight. 103 and 108. Yeah. yeah. So a difference of five made a made a little bit of a difference at distance, and you think, well, what? I mean, a little bit of a difference. What does that matter? Well, if you do everything perfectly, it probably doesn't matter that much, but the further you go, the more it matters. And when's the last time everybody or the human did everything exactly perfectly? It doesn't happen very very often. Well, and you also had two different bullet designs. You had the ELDX and the ELDM. Oh, I thought they were the exact same. No, the ELDX is an expanding bullet designed for hunting and the ELDM is a match bullet. Ah, okay. Yeah. I didn't catch that difference. Yeah. It's good to know because I'm writing up that review. And then you've got, you know, you got different bullet designs. You have the Spitzer design, you have the boat tail design, you have the saw point design, you have the full metal jacket design. Yeah. Uh, you have the, the OTM, which we used to call BTHP. Uh, so let's go ahead and talk about that. Well, the, the whole reason I'm talking about all this is because what I did recently is I, uh, I got, I told I did what I told you guys to do. I, I got a Brownells MPO scope. Uh, it's the three to eighteen with a thirty-four millimeter. Uh, it's the three to eighteen with a thirty-four millimeter tube, and I think the what is the objective lens? Is it fifty or fifty-five? Fifty-six. I I, fifty, I think. I can't remember. I think it's fifty. Uh, it, it's pretty good. It's it's, and I mounted it onto a Savage Model Eleven bolt action chambered in two sixty Remington. Now you're like, oh, 260 Remington, that's an old cartridge. That's like grandpa's cartridge. <laughs> the 260 Remington uh, has only been around since 1997. It's less than 30 years old. <laughs> you're like, oh, that's an old cartridge. <laughs> no, it's comparatively, it's actually a new cartridge. Uh, when, you, when you compare it, it's actually a new cartridge. Uh, so I, I went out the uh, to the range. Yeah, 50 uh, I guess later. it was Saturday or su- Sunday. Yeah, and uh, I I zeroed the MPO scope, and uh, I got it. I got it down. And uh, the interesting thing about the 260. Did you zero it, it like a savage? Yeah, I zeroed it like a savage. Uh, the 260 uses the exact same bullets. The bullet diameter is point two six four, and the bullet diameter on a 6.5 Creedmoor is 0.264. And, and it's, it's interesting to me um, how people are just like goo goo gaga over the, uh, the Creedmoor. But if you look at the stats, the 6.5 Creedmoor and the 260 Remington are like this. They're, they're like within two percentage points of being the, 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 the overall length is the, the overall length goes to the creed more, but not by very much. The, and it, it's just, I don't know. They're, they use this. I mean, like I said, the same bullets, it's, it's a, it's a 0. 0.264, 22644 inches or 6.72 millimeter. So the six, five creed more is actually a 6.72 uh, and that boy, that would get confusing if you called something a six seven two. Ima- imagine, guys, it, Jared, if if somebody, if a, a company decided they were going to make a cartridge and call it the six point seven two whatever. Mm-hmm. You're like, so you've got seven point six, the seven six two by 39 by 51 by 54 and then someone's like no 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 it's it's 6.7 <laughs> just stop 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 uh yeah yeah it's 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 something so uh yeah it, it's it's interesting to me how we get as americans we get super excited and wrapped around the axle about a cartridge when the difference between that cartridge and another one is 
Yeah, but you get you get 48 feet per second more velocity out of the new one. <laughs> you can put two grains more powder in that new one. You put 1.5 grains more powder in that case of the new one. You're like, wow, <laughs> can I do that? Uh, for you geeks out there uh, who are wondering about the... Uh, the 260 Remington. The 260 Remington basically is a 308 Winchester case necked down to take the 264 bullet, the 6.7. So instead of being a 30 caliber, it's a 26 caliber. Um, no, it's either, and that we we've been the ammo manufacturers been doing that for a long time, taking the, you know the 308, necking it down, or the 30 out six and necking it down. That's very common. Yeah. I was just going to say that the 260 Remington, not this one from Savage, but one from DPMS was the first sponsorship rifle I ever got when I was uh, doing MMA. Yeah. Yeah. They, they took an AR-10 and they chambered it from 308 down to 260. How are they able to do that? Magic. How are they able to do that? Because it's the same, it's the same uh, basically car- case size. It's a short action. It was a short action. You're like, how is that a short action? Well, because the 30 out six is a long action, and a 270 is based on is a neck down. A 270 is a neck down, 30 out six. What? Get out of here! So they're long actions. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, I don't want to get too far down the road. I mean, we we really could. You know, you've got the 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 308 Winchester. And neck down to 243 for the 243 Winchester and the 708, which is a 308 neck down. Then they do the opposite. Then they like neck them up. They, they widen it uh, for like the 338 Federal is a 308, basically a 308 case opened up to take a 338 bullet. You're like, dude, now you're just, now you're over the rainbow. Yeah, I know. I, I get it. <laughs> You're like that that 308 Winchester case is pretty darn useful, isn't it? Isn't it? You know, do you know that the 308 Winchester case, that the case head, uh, the base of it, um, is the exact same diameter as a 45 ACP? Hmm. Did you I know that? that? Yep, it is. Yep. Hmm. If you took a 45 ACP case and a 308 and you put them butt to butt, you're like, holy crap. Like they're the same size. I could put this in my pistol. That'll be awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you could. There you go. There you yeah, go. it's not any more pressure or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. All you right. You could probably put it in a 40, right? Because they're they're built to withstand well, the yeah. insane amounts of pressure. Yeah. The nine millimeter is actually identical to something else. What's the nine actually? By the way, guys, I'm kidding. So yeah. I don't I think the nine seriously is pretty close to the base of a as of a two two three case. I digress, but I digress. And all the, all the guys who watch the Beverly Hills cop two, they're like, yeah, you take three Oh eight, you cut them down and you make 44 auto mag. That's a thing. So that's a thing. And for those of you that don't know what a 44 auto mag is, there is a 44 auto mag. And, uh, if you have more dollars and cents and you have a lot of time in your hands, you can, uh, uh, if you like spending $10 per trigger press, there you go. Uh, there you go. Oh, and of course, of course, of course, a horse is a horse, of course, of course. Uh, before I went to the range, I disassembled the Savage, and I pulled the bolt out, and I cleaned it, and uh, I put the frog lubage on it. I put the frog lubage on it, and I, uh, well, I uh, went to the range with it. And that that's something, as you're breaking in bolt-action guns, you want to you wanna make sure that... Uh, that they have lube on the bolt. Um, that's that's pretty much the only place on a bolt action rifle that you need to put lube is on the bolt, right? I mean, you can if you're worried about your the the external steel rusting or whatever, you can put lube on that. But uh, but you definitely want to have a little bit uh, of lube of lubrication on your on your bolt. So there you go. All right, that's your uh, that's your geek out for today. That's your Brownells bullet points geek out for today. 
Attention new listeners. We produced a complimentary online training course called Seven Training Tips That Could Save Your Life. Get instant access by joining the Student Lounge for free at studentofthegun.com. Do you watch Student of the Gun TV, read the blog, and follow us on Facebook? If you answered no to any of these questions, you are wrong, but you can easily fix yourself. Go to studentofthegun.com to find everything SOTG. Uh, did we talk about the good reading? Uh, not yet. That's the next thing, but just real quick comment. I'm looking around. I can see four monitors. None of them are Dells. <laughs> I have two Azus and two Acers. There you go. So there you go. That, that's how we feel about Dell in this house. All right. Go ahead and pick it up with the good reading in three, two, one. All right. Yeah, I got some recommended reading for you guys. If you, uh, well, if you've been paying attention to what we do and who we do it with and all that, uh, our buddy uh, Marty, also known as Left Hand, over at the Talking Lead podcast, uh, we've been friends for ten plus years now, and. Uh, he has a, a frequent guest on his AK corner, and it's not me. Uh, I just shoot AKs. I don't know anything about them. But uh, Marco Vrobiev. Marco Vrobiev is a uh, former Spetsnaz soldier, now U.S. citizen, entrepreneur, gun builder, writer, historian, consultant, smart dude. Uh, he's, he is a walking encyclopedia of... AK knowledge. Uh, and he wrote this book that I'm holding in my hand right here. It's called uh, The AK-47 Survival and Evolution of the World's Most Prolific Gun by Marco Vorobiev. And uh, Marco actually had the, the honor uh, when he used to live in the, uh, in the former Soviet Union of uh, being able to sit down face-to-face with uh, Mikhail Kalashnikov. Pretty freaking righteous. So there's a, there's a picture of Mikhail with the uh, author on page number 18. So this book is available uh, on Amazon right now, and it's been out since 2018. I, I looked it up. This is my copy, uh, but I looked it up. It's been out since 2018. But here's the rub. It only has 22 reviews. That's bull crap. That's that's some hardcore bullcrap right there. <laughs> would you would you say that that's fair? That that is that's some serious bullcrap right there, boys. I haven't I haven't read the book, but I would yeah. Well, by the way that you've talked about it, yes, that's bullcrap. Yeah, yeah. Well, here's what I know. I, I haven't gotten all the way through this book yet. Actually, I just started it, but I know from my conversations uh, and the time I've spent um, around Marco that he is like a literal walking encyclopedia of AK knowledge. And there's no reason for a book like this to have been out as long as it has and only have 22 reviews. That's just crap. But you know what I'm afraid of? Uh, it's a gun digest publication. Oh, yeah. That's not what I'm afraid of. Um, but you know, how long have I been playing the writing books for other people game? Long time, uh, right? Well, I mean, you, yeah. Yeah. No, I write them for me now. Yeah, I would say you, you got educated on how that works. Yeah, and- how that works. Yeah, how that works. Um, writing books for other people, unless your name is Jack Carr or uh, Tom Clancy or Stephen King or something like that, uh, when you write books for other people, this is how it works. The other people, the publisher makes a lot of money or no money, depending uh, and you make none, or you make TT, very little, right? Um, ask our buddy Mike, Mike Deddy. Mike Deddy, guns across the border. You know, a, like a, a, a world, a no, what would you say, world famous story. Uh, I would say it's world famous. It's like nationally famous story. He was right there in the middle of it. Writes a book for a publisher. Publisher makes the money, and uh, yeah. So I'm I'm I haven't talked to Marco personally about it yet, but I I wonder how much or if anything he's getting from the sales of these books. Oh, uh, a lot of companies, uh, 
publishers will pay a one-time fee to authors as well. And this, this is a perf- personal preference on the, like for the author, right? So if you're listening and you are interested in writing a book and publishing a book, this is good information for you where it depends on your preference and it, and it also depends on your negotiation skills because most things in the, at least nowadays, they didn't used to be as negotiable because it was like you publish through us or you don't publish at all. Nowadays, there's quite a few publishing companies and you can self-publish as well. Mm-hmm. So as long as you're willing to do the promotion, then self-publishing might be the way for you. But yeah, the uh, couple ways that that works is the publishers will, will um, either offer a one-time fee or a one-time fee and a small royalty or a larger royalty in lieu of a one-time fee up front. And there's benefits to all of that stuff, right? It just depends on who you are and what you like to do. But one of the things that I've learned along the way is there's a lot of work outside of just writing a book. There's the editing, there's the formatting, there's everything. And if you're willing to do some of that instead of having the publisher do it, then you obviously, it'll warrant a bigger pay for you on the back end or even on the front end. Oh, so if you're obviously the more you do, the more negotiating power you have in general. But if you don't want to do that stuff and you just want to write books, then it might be a good way to go because the the one thing that uh, you need to keep in mind is that a lot of the publishers that tell you, Hey, I'm going to publish on, on Amazon and you're going to be in Walmart. It's, it's a single publishing platform that actually feeds all of that. And they're not doing you a favor because what, Some I know what has happened to some of our friends is the publishing rights then go to that entity and then you can no longer, if they decide they don't want to push or market the book anymore, you can do it, but you're not going to have any control over the future of that product. So there's a lot of things that you have to think about and consider if you're going to be writing a book and publishing it. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the basic the, the two basic things are are flat fee or royalties right like we'll give you we'll pay you x thousand dollars to write this book and we'll pay it to you up front and or we'll give you a five percent royalty right five percent on sales and that's five percent on sales after production after costs yeah, net sales. That's yeah, where net some sales. people get confused. It's like, oh, five percent sales. If they're selling the book for twenty bucks and they sell ten thousand copies, it's like, oh, maybe that's a a decent paycheck for some people. Mm-hmm. But it's not the case. You have to take out all the costs and whatnot. Yeah, and they're like, well, they're selling it for twenty a piece, but it's a hardcover, so that it actually it actually costs seven dollars per unit to produce. Blah blah blah. Plus, plus the time that the publisher spent editing. Plus the time that they spent. Mm-hmm how many employees do they have there's a there's a lot of unknowns there but that's where in the in the contract process a if you can afford to do so hire somebody that actually knows contracts in that realm have them read it yeah. it'll cost you a few hundred dollars maybe a thousand bucks but it'll save you more than that in the long run i'm sure of it well yeah like it like if you're like i said if you're if your your name is you know uh if you have big name and if you're like Jack Carr or Tom Clancy or Stephen King or, or whoever, you know, uh, and, and you're going to go with Simon and Schuster, Simon and Schuster, or Funk and Wagnall or whatever, Funk you're going to you're going to publish your Funk and Wagnall uh, or Simon and Schuster or Random House or whatever. Uh, yeah, if they're going to put all of your books in every Barnes and Noble and every Walmart or whatever, uh, yeah, I got burned. I got you want a personal story. I'll tell you a personal story. So many, 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 many moons ago, um, I was asked to write a book uh, for a company, and I, and I I did, and and it was a percentage, right? I was gonna get a royalty, uh, and then did that, and then I found out that the publisher decided that they weren't really that interested in pr- promoting the book. And so the royalties were TT. They were, you know, uh, a check for, you know, a, a three month check for $18, you know, you know, a quarterly check for $18 and 67 cents. And I'm like, okay, well this is crap. Right. Yeah. So 
Next time, the next time that happened, somebody came around and they said, hey, would you write a book for me? Would you write a book for us, for our company? And, and, there, and I said, yeah. I said, but I need to be paid up front because I'd been burned by previous ones who uh, decided, well, we're going to write it, but then we're done with that or we're bored with it or whatever. Uh, and, and the royalties were just <laughs> right. So they're like, hey, no problem. We'll pay you X upfront, right? Uh, on delivery. You write the book and deliver it. We'll write you a check. We'll pay you for it. And I was like, okay, cool. Cool deal, bro. So I did that. What they, what they neglected to tell me was the books were all going to Walmart nationwide. They were going to have nationwide Walmart distribution for the books. So, obviously. So listen, listen to his advice because he's been on both ends of it. Yeah, obviously, uh, it would have been far better for me during the second circumstance to take a percentage because they, they, they were on the shelves of every Walmart in, in, in the country, right? So I would have gotten a, a lot better deal. Potentially. So, yeah. Some things I've heard some horror stories about stocking products with big box stores like Walmart. Yeah. Where in some cases, this is hearsay. I don't have any personal experience with this, mm. but what I've heard is that uh, the, some of the contracts were written in such a way that if Walmart doesn't sell X amount of units in the first month, then they return mm. get a refund. So it's, it, yeah. Oh, that's that. That's another thing. Uh, I've talked to uh, to people, a, a guy who worked with a publisher, and he got out an advance, and and then a royalty, and and he went and he challenged. And this is the thing: is I, I, we, I didn't really need for this to be a book discussion, but um, it might is, be useful for somebody that wants to write a book in our audience. What are are you really legitimately getting the the royalties that are owed to you? Because what my, uh, my friend said is he's like, he said, hey, where are my royalty checks? And they're like, oh, well, we, we sent these out to da-da-da, and they only sold so many units, and then they, they, they returned so many units, and then then so we don't, you know. And, and so then that, as an author, you're like, oh, whoa, 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 that's not my problem. That's not a me problem. That's a you problem. Well, and we had to buy the Ferrari and wrap it with the book. Stuff, yeah. So that was the marketing expense. It's like, yeah. Yeah, so they're like, well, yeah, they, they bought so many or they took delivery of so many, but then they shipped so many back. And so it's like that comes you're like that, 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 that. So, you know, as the author, you you don't want to if you're on a contract for a publishing company, your job is not to figure out all of that minutia, right? And then when they come to you and they're like, well, we, we don't owe you any royalties because Barnes and Noble returned 500 books last month or whatever. And you're like, whoa, whoa, that's not a me problem. That's a you problem. Uh, so, yeah, you really, unfortunately, the, the sad reality of it is, is you can't trust publishing companies. It's, it's just like, you know, in, this, in the 50s and 60s, when when all of these record producers were just ripping off talent they were just robbing them there are so many horror stories if you guys are into music horror stories of the the uh, the 1950s and 60s when these these managers and these and these uh you know uh, record companies were just ripping off the artists they were making tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and the artists were getting like pfft, a pittance, right? Um, and, and that's why you have to have attorneys. Unfortunately, um, it'd be a great world if we didn't have to have attorneys. Uh, but in a situation like that, uh, yeah, and the thing is, they, they don't care. Most of these publishing houses are in New York. And you're out. You're just a cog. You're just out there in the country, and they know they don't care about you. There's a, in 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 their eyes, there are a hundred of you. There are a hundred other yous out there. So you're not special, and they don't care about you. Uh, very rarely do they care about you. Uh, 
like I said, it's the that's whole, a, that that depends on the individual rep from the company. And yeah, so one one rep could really care about you, but then another one comes in and takes their place. Yeah, the but they and doesn't care. We've seen that, and it's with some companies that are uh, that we're acquainted with, where somebody <laughs> yeah. that was really respected and 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 uh, did well on the client's part, they retired or didn't decided not to do what they were doing anymore. And, oh yeah. Uh, somebody else came in and it's like, well, I'm going to do this and this and this, because I don't really, you know, I don't have that long relationship with these clients. So I don't care about them as much as the person before me. Yeah. All right. So that's your, uh, that's your book knowledge today. Your AK, your ACK knowledge and your book knowledge and your publishing knowledge and, and all that stuff. So, but the good news is, is in, in the modern world, if you're a go-getter, uh, if you're willing to hustle, uh, you can actually make your own money and you can can live and die or you, you either succeed or you'll fail based on your own merit. And, and that's important is, you know, if you you put in all the effort and you still fail because somebody else didn't care, that that sucks. But, you know, if you put in all the effort and you do well, then great. You earned it. And if you don't put in the effort and don't do well, well, that's, that's on you. Uh, speaking of doing well, let's go to studentofthegun.com slash culture, C-U-L-T-U-R-E, culture, and that is in the show notes. Uh, you can see it right there, in the show notes. And uh, you can use the promo code SOTG at Defiant Munitions, mytopo.com. Mytopo, that's, a, uh, that's maps, uh, topographic maps. At Crossbreed Holsters, at Brownells, who we were just talking about, at Frog Lube, and soon to be others. So, uh, before you spend money with any of those companies, uh, make sure that you uh, check and see if there's a promo code. And I just told you there was, so you don't need to check now. There you go. All right, now it's time for me to be quiet and Zach to hip you to some cool info. ShopSOTG.com is the perfect place to go if you are a student of the gun. Whether you want to expand your brain, increase your marksmanship, or help keep your family safe. All that, plus the pimp hand brands that you love. ShopSOTG.com has almost anything that an American patriot would want. Education, enlightenment, and entertainment, and we're open 24-7. Check out ShopSOTG.com today and see for yourself. Yes, indeed. That's what you should do. Zach, what is new and cool uh, shop us OTG. Yes, indeed you do. And we got two things to let you know about today. First off being that we have restocked on the Patriot Fire Team line of books. We got the manual, the equipment guide, the planner, or the bulk, uh, co- what is it, collection, collaboration, conglomeration? Compilation. Compilation of all three of you just want to get them all in one big-ass tome over on shopsotg.com. Stock up on the PFT books. And in addition to that, uh, as you know, as you're probably aware, the next, or whatever, the an- annual National Hug Your AK Day is approaching fast, and this year we have something a little special. Joe, would you like to tell them about it, or should I continue to tell them about it? Well, I could talk about it. We've got a, a Run AKM shirt that we're going to be doing for you guys if you've seen the design for Run DMC. It's kind of like that, but it says Run AKM. That's what we're going to do for this year's Hug Your AK Day. And we've got something else. The uh, Zach, do you, your dad, do you want to talk about this? Because I don't know many details. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. Uh, the Run AKM is actually, I really, I really love that because yeah, you can cool. wear that in public and those who get it will get it and those who don't won't. So it's, it's, it'll it's be like it, the, the original stoner shirt. And it's like a profile quite shirt. often. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, if, if people get it, I'm like, okay, we could probably be friends. We could be for if, if they give you the thumbs up or they're pointing there and they're like, yeah. And it's more but, rare than I thought it would be. I yeah. thought more people would get it, especially here in Utah, but it's not the case. Yeah. Well, remember my, my guns kill. Yeah. Shirt. Yeah. <laughs> it said guns <laughs> kill in really bold letters. And then in, in small letters underneath it said hippies. Yeah. Oh, I miss that shirt so much. That was that was my ultimate profiling shirt. Either people would read it, they would look, and they would start out smiling, and then they would frown as they finished it, 
or it would be the opposite. They would frown and then they would finish reading and then they'd laugh. And I'm like, ha ha ha. If you laughed at the end, yeah, we're, we're good. Yeah. Yeah. Gun skill. Yep. So you can get the pre-order the run AKM shirt at shop SOTG.com. And we're going to make sure that it's available for you and we'll have it to you by hug your AK day. So what I want you to do is put that shirt on, hug your AK, take the pictures and participate in hug your AK day with your run AKM shirt this year. Yeah. Now the thing oh, that yeah. I asked dad to talk about a second ago, he's going to do it now. Yeah. So <sighs> we lost our friend Zach Hall this week. Uh, Zach Hall of Atlas Defense, formerly of Red Jacket. Zach Hall was a a fantastic dude, smart guy, skilled engineer, good friend, cigar lover, and uh, he was a positive light in life, is what he was. He was, and uh, he's been fighting fighting cancer for three plus years now. Uh, he was one of those one of those success stories where you go in. And the doctor's like, oh, it's really bad. Uh, you know, wrap up, you know, go home and wrap up your business because in six months you're going to be gone. And uh, he proved him wrong. He was one of those guys who proved him wrong. He, he stuck around, kept going, and stayed with us longer than, uh, longer than they said he was going to. Um, but uh, Zach, Zach was an AK guy. He built AKs. He shot AKs. And uh, he, his birthday is October 18th. Yeah. Uh, when, when we came up with the National Hug Your AK Day uh, in 2012 uh, uh, and, and made it October 18th, we didn't know we were doing it on Zach's birthday. It was his birthday present. It, it, was, just a, it was just a coincidence. And then uh, he, he used to say, he's like, he goes, well, I'll never forget. <laughs> and, he, you know, he posted pictures. He's like, I'll never forget. It's on my birthday. Um, so this year, and, and geez, is it only two months away? Yeah. Whew. So in two months, it's going to be National Hug Your AK Day again. And uh, we're going to work with Occam Defense and uh, Brian Keeney over at Occam is going to produce, he's building a custom AK right now, an Occam Defense AK. And it's, we're going to be doing a giveaway uh, in, in, in the, uh, the money that we get is going to go uh, to directly to uh, Zach's wife and son. So uh, stay tuned for the, for the specs, for the details. Uh, but I actually just talked to Brian uh, yesterday, and um, that's so that's what we're gonna do. So it'll be in at honor of giveaway dot com is where you can yep. go to do that. Yeah, and it's not up yet. Like Dad said, there it'll be up once we get the details and whatnot. But that's gonna happen. Yeah. And I want to so take this. That's gonna happen. I want to take this opportunity to remind people that were involved in the previous giveaway that. The, the winners are still being chosen because the confirmations are not happening. So if you were involved in that raffle, then ch make sure that you're checking the email that you used because at this point it's, it's getting very um, frustrating to have to continue to pick people and send new emails and then wait. And then, Oh, well, that person didn't answer either. So if you're going to join in our, on a raffle, then make sure that you check the email that you use. Yeah, I we, and we've gone down this road before, and it and it's mind boggling to me. It's mind yeah. that people do this. They're like, "Well, I'm going to sign up for this thing, but I'm not going to use uh, my normal email because I don't want to get a bunch of spam and stuff. I'm going to use this other email, the one that I only check once every six months or three months, or or the one that I forgot about or whatever." Yeah. You know, and then we send an email, say, congratulations, you're the winner. Please, you know, please respond within 24 hours. And then tick tock times goes by. And then we got to pick another one and they got to pick another one. It's like, why would you sign up for a, an online contest 
where you can win something. And we give away, we legitimately give away good stuff. And your percentage, the percentage of you, or the, the chances of you winning from us are pretty high. Uh, and it just dumbfounds me, you know, that people will do that. You know? They're like, oh, yeah, I don't, I, I don't want to get spammed, so uh, I'll, I'll give them this one email that I never check, and it's not an important email. It's like, or the, the fun one, going back to the old days when we were in the other studio, was like a week or two later, people would eventually get around to checking their email. They're like, hey, man, I got this email from you. Sorry, it was 10 days ago. It's too late. It is not fair to everybody else for to draw your name and then have to sit on it for a week. It's, it's bull crap. It's bull crap. So if you don't want to participate, don't. If you don't want to participate, don't. I don't care. Uh, but if you do want to participate, then actually participate. Actually be involved. All right, so that is that, Mister. That's that. We need to uh, we need to kick this thing in the in the butt. So let's go ahead and jump right over to our student of the gun homeroom, brought to you by CrossbreedHolsters dot com. All right. If you go to crossfreedholsters.com and you decide to get yourself a custom, one of a kind, unique uh, super tuck or reckoning or whatever, uh, make sure you use the promo code SOTG. Uh, or, and so what do we got today? We've got a uh, story from truthaboutguns.com. You remember that, that dude, Kyle Rittenhouse? You're like, yeah, of course. How could we forget? Uh, well, He's, he's been working with some other folks behind the scenes, and they have come up with a, a foundation. And what is this all about? Well, we're going to tell you because Jared's going to give you the details from the story from August 18th. Uh, so it's a pretty new story, August 18th, 2023. Truth about from guns. Truthaboutguns.com. Kyle Rittenhouse starts up a new gun rights org focused on supporting individuals who have defended themselves. Literally nothing Kyle Rittenhouse does escapes notice. All of the usual suspects do literally everything they can to paint anything he's involved in as somehow dark, nefarious, and deeply, deeply concerning. An easy tip off is the apparent self imposed minimum quota editors. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, I like this. An easy tip off is the apparent self imposed minimum quota that editors place on the use of terms like far right in any article they publish about him. The latest spate of news of note is that Rittenhouse has founded a new gun rights org here in Texas. The left leaning Texas Tribune made sure to use all of the requisite tropes in their report. Kyle Rittenhouse, the, the right-wing activist who was famously acquitted of killing two Black Lives Matter protesters in 2020, is stepping up his involvement in Texas politics. Already this year, he's rallied with a Texas secessionist movement leader, endorsed ultra-conservative midterm candidates, and railed against Texas gun control legislation and the impeachment of Attorney General Ken Paxton. Now Rittenhouse is creating a nonprofit in the state with help from well-connected far-right political actors. Ooh, far-right. should be afraid. They oh, managed be afraid. to jimmy in the term right-wing, mention two dead BLMers, secessionarianism, ultra-conservatism, unnamed and by implication somehow shady, far-right political actors, and tied Rittenhouse to Texas, Texas's impeached attorney general, all within three very brief paragraphs. Impressive. The UK's independent took much the same slanted tack on the story. None of these uh, crossed out hit pieces and called it reports shed much light on what the newly founded Rittenhouse Foundation's raison d'etre raison raison really is beyond quoting a blurb, the new nonprofit filed with the state. In a July 23rd filing, with the Texas Secretary of State's office, he described the Rittenhouse Foundation as a nonprofit that protects human and civil rights secured by law, including an individual's inalienable right to bear arms. 
and ensures the Second Amendment is preserved through education and legal assistance. That sounds terrible. Yeah. Since we were curious about how Kyle and the new foundation's director envision the Rittenhouse Foundation's goals and mission, we talked to the TRF board member, Chris McNutt, last night. McNutt is also the president of Texas Gun Rights. I think we've talked to this dude before. Uh, We wanted to know how the Rittenhouse Foundation will be different from other gun rights orgs that are already out there doing very good work. It turns out that the TRF's mission will be very different from those orgs like the Firearms Policy, FPC, SAF, GOA, and NAGR. Most of you see which ones those are. So the Rittenhouse Foundation's work will be much more likely, much more narrowly focused on supporting individuals after they defend themselves with firearms. Kyle obviously endured a uh, seismical seismically high profile and arduous battle in defending himself against the murder and other charges against him after his defensive gun use on the streets of Kenosha. Some deep pocketed individuals and gun rights orgs supported him through that process, but it was a long, very difficult slog. And while he found not guilty on uh, while he was found on not guilty on all charges, he's still fighting the battle to this day in civil court cases brought by gauge cross groups and others. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, uh, we, we can go ahead and put a pin in that right there. Uh, yeah. It, thank, thank goodness that, that people stepped up for this guy because this was nothing but a pure unadulterated witch hunt from, from the word go. We knew that this kid defended himself. It was, he was all by himself defending himself against a mob. This gross crutes, piece of crap, had a pistol in his hand, was pointing a gun at him. And he's also a felon in possession of a gun, which the media conveniently forgets to talk about all the time. They forget to mention that gross groots, this, this is, they paint this piece of human filth as a victim, who's not a victim, who's the attacker. Uh, and, uh, The reason that we put this in the homeroom is because it's about being dangerous on demand, right? And we've spoken innumerable times about there's there's three things that you need to to learn in training, and there's how to shoot, which basically everybody does. Every NRA certified firearms instructor teaches you the how to shoot. You know, this is these are the sights, and this is blah blah blah. Um, When to shoot? The more few, uh, you know, more people are teaching that now, but uh, very rarely do they talk about what now. You know, we in the uh, the Armed Living DVD, we talk about how to shoot, when to shoot, and what now. What happens after? Like we've said, like ad nauseum, it's not a freaking Hollywood movie. You don't get to to smoke all the bad guys and then like high five and and you know make some Bruce Willis or Eddie Murphy quip or something and walk off screen while they roll credits. That's not how it works. Uh, There's a lot of other stuff, you know, um, like James and and Jay, you said when, when the, when the gun, when the noise from the gunfire ends, the fight's actually just begun. Um, You have to prove that you were the good guy. You have to establish that you were the good guy and lots of things can happen. Lots of terrible things can happen because We live in a country that is populated by cowards and criminals. We live in a country that has both cowards and criminals in office. As we saw with Kyle Rittenhouse, we had cowards and criminals that tried to crucify this kid. This this was a complete and total witch hunt in order to placate the criminals the scum, the villainy of our country. I mean, who were they hoping to appease by railroading this kid through the legal system when they knew from the word go, they knew from the moment that they, that they charged this kid that he was not guilty. But it didn't matter. 
didn't matter to them because it was a political witch hunt because they are evil human beings. They were, they're cowards. They're criminals. So not only do you have to fight against the criminal vermin that are on the streets, the criminal vermin that live in the same city that you do, after you fight against those criminal vermin, then you have to deal with the criminal vermin in the prosecutor's office, the criminal vermin in the media, the criminal vermin in the freaking mayor's office. And that's what this is all about. That's what it seems to me, you guys correct me if I'm wrong, that that's what this new foundation is designed to do, to help people who have done the right thing, who followed the rules and did nothing wrong except save the, the only thing they did was they were forced to save their own lives against criminal vermin. And now the vermin in the media and the prosecutor's office and so forth are coming after them. And how do we defend against that? And it looks like the Rittenhouse Foundation is the way. All right, moving on. Speaking of criminals, we got to get this thing rolling and let's keep on going. Uh, we got a story here from, I believe it's a, the politico.com. I just talked to with Mark Walters on his radio program a couple of days ago about this. And, uh, Jared, you just, just give us the quick deets, uh, on this one. New Jersey can sue gun companies under public nuisance law, federal appeals panel rules. Um, judge Qureshi had uh, temporarily blocked the law from taking effect earlier this year. They, so New Jersey, so Jersey has decided that it has the right to sue gun manufacturers. Law. Federal appeals court ruled Thursday, handing a majority victory. Oh, I'm sorry, handing a major victory to the state after last year's U.S. Supreme Court decision loosening public carrying restrictions. The that that annoys me. Loosening public <sighs> carrying restrictions. Well, they shouldn't be there in the first place. You mean granting, like going back to what does freedom. the Constitution say? Freedom back to the people. The Third Court of Appeals, the Third Circuit Court of Appeals dismissal of a challenge brought by the National Shooting Sports Foundation last year came as New Jersey and other states look for novel ways to balance public safety with gun rights under the High Court's June 2022 ruling in the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association, Inc. versus Bruin. New Jersey's public nuisance law signed by Democratic Governor Phil Murphy a month later may offer a template to other states following Thursday's ruling, which said that the shooting foundation jumped the gun in its challenge and did not justify the court's intervention. Other blue states, such as Delaware and California, have enacted similar measures designed to open the gun industry to legal action. Uh, one of the concerning things here is this is setting precedent. Mm-hmm. because the foundation, It's extremely concerning. Yeah, this is a quote from the court. Because the foundation's case is not yet fully formed, we will vacate the pre- preliminary injunction and remand with instructions to de- dismiss this action for lack of jurisdiction. So. Uh, so, so far, they're what saying I've seen about this in in different stories is that the NSSF will while trying to do this while filing this um, complaint I don't remember what it's called um, but f- going forward with this while they were trying to protect people's uh, liberty and their their rights that are protected in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights they weren't it doesn't seem that they were prepared with what they should have been prepared with to move well, forward. What, what the court's saying is that they don't have standing because they haven't been injured. Right. So they have to, what their court is saying is you have to wait until you've been injured. Yeah. That, that in, that in and of itself it is insane. You have a state that is blatantly violating the United States constitution. That, that, that is injury. That that's injury. Yeah, uh, but this 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 freaking third circuit court, like, oh no, are you you know you haven't been injured yet, so you can't seek recompense. So that that's akin to someone who's like, remember, remember we talked about this in the past year. Uh, never throw the who gives the advice. Never throw the first punch. Losers. Never never fire until fired upon. It's like people, people who not, give 
been in a fight before. Yeah, people who give that advice, see, they people who give that advice don't ever think they'll have to use it. But, you know, if, if uh, Chuck Liddell comes up to you in a, like, accost you in a bar, I would say it's probably a bad idea to let him throw the first punch because that's probably going to be the only one. Um, you know, never fire unless fired upon. It's like, um, well, what if the fired upon, what if that first shot is the one that kills me? Well, I guess it stinks to be you. You know, you can't be the aggressor in the situation. But l- let's go ahead and talk about uh, firearms industry people. Now, there's two things we got going here. Number one, would you be, would any insurance company insure a, a firearms whether it's it's gun makers, ammunition makers, accessory makers, you know, would you be insane to insure someone who does business in New Jersey or California for that matter? So what the new what New Jersey has said is that we can sue you for engaging in lawful commerce. You know what we need? You know what they need? The companies need somebody like Rick to help them destroy these people. Right. Uh, seriously, I would. I want to ask Rick: Is it? Would it be insane for you to insure? Let's say. Let's say Remington Arms decides they're going to continue to sell guns in New Jersey, because what New Jersey is saying is that Remington Arms, or fill in the blank, Smith and Wesson doesn't matter. If somebody goes into a store and buys one of your guns, and then they go out, and heck, it could be like Rittenhouse. They could, they could be, you know, they could be in public being beaten to the ground, use the gun with, with the label on it, Smith and Wesson, Remington, whatever, to shoot and kill their attacker. Then their, their, the criminal prosecutors drag them before the courts and they go on a political witch hunt and they decide they're going to make an example of Smith and Wesson, Remington, fill in the blank. Right. And according to their law, they're like, well, you know, they shouldn't have da 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 da. This is crazy. There's already there's already reckless, negligent liability in place. If a company deliberately, purposely, knowingly, recklessly produces a bad product, produces a dangerous product, produces a product that that they know is dangerous or that they know will do whatever, there there's that's already there. What we're talking about is the the state granting itself the authority to just arbitrarily attack a legitimate, lawful business, to attack a business that is engaged in lawful commerce. And, you know, one of the things that Mark and I talked about on the radio, on his show, was when is our industry going to stand up and say, sorry, no more? When is Smith and Wesson, Sig, Glock, Phil Ruger, fill in the blank, going to publicly do, do a press release and say, at, you know, sit, based on this ruling, we will no longer ship our products into the state of New Jersey. They don't go to police departments. They don't go to gun dealers. They don't go to distributors. They don't go into New Jersey. No more. I, I wonder if there are uh, – if some of the companies that you just mentioned were um, – they're supporting foundations like the Second Amendment Foundation, Gun Owners of America, more so now than I've ever seen before. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if they're being pushed in that direction and they – and uh, probably legal says, hey, don't do that, or the salespeople are like, hey, we have a lot of customers there or whatever that is. I don't know the reason behind it where you would um, not do both at the same time. Well, but I'm wondering it, it's, if this, yeah. th- these thing, things like this are pushing those companies. It's like, okay, you know what? You've kind of backed us into a wall here. We didn't want to have to do this because it affects everybody involved. It affects our customers. Uh, their, the customer's ability to- Who cares? Enjoy their liberty. It affects the- company's ability to continue to maintain profit and continue to run and build these things it affects a lot of people in different ways 
It's like, we didn't want to do this, but you're pushing us down this path. So I think that from what I've seen after, um, man, I don't even remember which one it was, which big ordeal it was about firearms. And I think it was after the Daniel defense stuff happened, but, um, a lot of the companies in the industry, the bigger companies are starting to publicly support. I don't know how long they've made donations to these organizations like second amendment foundation and GOA, but they're starting to publicly do it, which means yeah. that they're being driven in that direction to say, Hey, enough is enough, which is one of those things is like, well, maybe if we did this earlier, it would have been better. Yeah. But we don't know until you do it. Right. Once you do it, then that's when you know how much it's actually going to affect your company, your customers, et cetera. You know how I've said before that that the American gun buying public is constantly searching for Judas, right? Ever since the Smith and Wesson, Bill Clinton, you know, um, deal the deal with the devil, right? Our industry is always searching for Judas. They're always they're they're radar is always up and they're always they're looking to be betrayed because they have been quite frankly they've been betrayed before right and so they're always looking for that but in addition to looking for judas they're also looking for a hero they're also looking for somebody that they can support they're looking for somebody with the guts to stand up and say no no more we're done by the way living your life wondering when the next time you're going to be betrayed is, has got to be exhausting. Well, it, how it, people do that. It is, but it's a natural human condition. You know, um, you know, yeah, look, you look at victims of it. Yeah. Okay. But the victims of abuse, oh, victims yeah. of abuse. Right. And so as you know, um, the American gun owner is a victim of abuse. They've been abused for 80 years. So that's why. They are a victim of abuse. If you want it, you want to, you want a court case. The American gun owner, the American citizen, is a victim of abuse by its government. But what it would take, and you say, oh, well, then you'll lose New Jersey sales. I'm gonna be really careful. I already, I already made the one mistake. But the sales that you would potentially lose by boycotting New Jersey would be made up tenfold if Sig Sauer, uh, and I'm not going to tell Sig what to do, but let us I'm just going to throw them out as an example. If like, I don't know which handgun the New Jersey Gestapo, the Stasi uh, in New Jersey is carrying. Don't know, don't care. But if that company would say, we're done, from this moment forward, until this act is, until this is rescinded, until it's overturned, until it's gone, whatever, um, no more, let's just say SIGs. I don't know what the Gestapo is carrying, but let's say SIGs. No more SIG products will ship into the state of New Jersey. Not to the state, not to government officials, no one. That's it. The entire country outside of that crap hole, that communist-run cesspool would cheer. That company sales would spike like you wouldn't believe. They're waiting. Americans are starving. Trump, Donald Trump is proof. Starving for unapologetic leadership. They don't want apologies. They don't want compromise. They don't want... Maybe if we keep selling these special, modified, state-approved, you know, neutered guns to the slaves in California and the slaves in New York and the slaves in New Jersey, maybe the slaves there will will want to love liberty, and then they'll... The, no, it doesn't work. It's not working. It has never worked. And it's short-sighted. It is extremely short-sighted. And we're, you're not going to regain liberty through compromise. I want to know, someone out there, show me an aggrieved, victimized, put upon people who gained liberty 
by compromising with their oppressors. Go. Give me the example. Write it in. Send me a postcard, P.O. Box 405 Boulder, Colorado. I want to know when the victims of oppression regained their liberty by compromising with their oppressors. Tell me, when did that happen? Has it ever happened in the history of our world? Go. No, you can't, because it's not reality. And until we stand up, until the the industry finds its collective balls and stands up and says, you know what, no more, no more. You know, you you want to oppress the people? You want to sue us? Good, fine. You don't get our guns. You know that the the Stasi in New Jersey is buying ammo from somebody. They're either buying it from Remington or Spear or, or CCI. I don't know who they're buying it from. Winchester, whatever. If that company were to stand up and say, you know what? No more bullets for Nazis. No more bullets for communists. No more ammo for the Stasi. Somebody else can sell ammo to the Stasi, but we're not going to. If they would stand up, but they don't have balls, they're neutered, they're ballless. They're like, oh, no, we have to look at our balance sheets, and we have to say, well, but what would happen? No, do the right thing. The American people are starving for unapologetic leadership, starving for it. And what do we get? What do we get from the freedom-loving, liberty-loving gun industry? We get compromise, and we get explanations, and we get talked to like we're stupid children. No, you stupid children don't understand. We have to sell ammo to the Nazis. We have to sell ammo to the Gestapo that uses that ammunition and uses those guns to oppress the people. Yeah, we have to do that because it's money and we like money and we don't care that we're selling our ammo and our guns to people that are taking them and using them to abuse the citizens. Whose ammo just killed that guy in uh, Salt Lake City? Well, you should have known better. Don't ever go on Facebook and say anything against the government because they'll find you and kill you. That was an example. So this New Jersey thing, it's only going to, it's going to grow like a cancer and get worse unless we find our balls and stand up and say no more. That's it. All right, I'm done. Uh, We got to wrap this sucker. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Bonus hour. All right. No cash means no rights. Uh, Our buddy, Russell Brand, he doesn't know he's our buddy, but he is our buddy. Russell Brand just did a whole thing, and they're they're running a test run down under. And uh, they're, they're serious about eliminating cash. No cash, no rights, no guns. Also, we're going to talk about making weight. And we're going to continue with our standards and elements on critical thinking, which we started last week, and a lot of you guys seem to like that. Uh, So if you'd like to join us, get your butts over to getsotg.com. That's G-E-T-S-O-T-G.com. Sign up and join the grad program. You know you want to. Uh, You should. And uh, be there or be square. Until the next time we're together, remember, you're a beginner once. Thanks for staying until the end. Want to water the seeds of freedom we planted together today? Head over to wherever you listen to us and leave a like, rating, or review. It makes a big difference. Have a show topic submission? We would love to hear it. Submit it to info at studentofthegun.com. A delightful human will get back to you faster than you can finish a one-box workout. Remember to check studentofthegun.com often for new and free content, giveaways, and more. Watch, listen, read, shop, and connect at studentofthegun.com. 
And remember, you are a beginner once, a student for life.